He just sets the bar so high that it's always inspiring because you just keep trying to do that. Hello, everyone, and thanks for checking us out today. You're listening to episode 23 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists. I'm your host, Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm also the founder of Whistlekick, makers of the best sparring gear available, as well as exciting apparel and accessories for traditional martial artists. You can learn more about our products, like our super comfy hooded sweatshirts, at whistlekick.com. And you can learn more about the podcast, including all of our past episodes, show notes for this one, and a lot more, over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And while you're on our website, don't forget to sign up for our newsletter full of information, discounts, and useful martial arts content. And if you're an Android user, you can check out our Android app on the Google Play Store. Just search for Whistlekick. It's an easy way to stay connected with the show. And now for the review of the week. Remember, we read an iTunes review every week, and if we read yours, you just email us at info at whistlekick.com, and we'll send you out a free prize pack. The shirt, probably a water bottle, stickers, and some other cool stuff. And we're even going to foot the shipping on that. This week's review comes to us from Sleepless Nights, and it's titled, A Great Resource for Knowledge Seekers, and it's a five-star review. And it starts out, I do a lot of thinking about how my training is affecting me spiritually, intellectually, and emotionally. As I increase my general martial arts education by hearing the stories and musings of far more experienced and advanced practitioners, as well as pick up new knowledge about other styles and traditions, I'm also struck that the prevailing theme is that pursuing martial arts training equals self-improvement. Tuning into these conversations helps me affirm my own progress as I struggle forward in my training. And thank you for that great review. And I have to say I agree. As I listen to the guests right along with you guys, I'm constantly inspired and reaffirmed in my own training. And now to the episode. Today we're joined by Sensei Terry Dow from New Hampshire. Sensei Dow is a kind man and a great martial artist, but he's probably best known as Superfoot Wallace's number one guy. If you've ever attended a Superfoot seminar, you've probably met Sensei Dow. Now, while his relationship with the legend is exciting and interesting, and we do talk about it, there's a lot more to Sensei Dow. I was happy to have him on the show and learn more about who he is, and I think you'll enjoy hearing what he has to say. So with that, Sensei Dow, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Pleasure to be here. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on, and I think we both know some of the places that we're going to go today, but who knows where we're actually going to end up, and that's always the fun place <laughs> for me, exactly. is to see where, see where the questions take us. And, you know, let's just start with the first one, the one that is probably the easiest. How'd you get into the martial arts and when and why and, and all that? I started martial arts um, in 1983 when I was nine years old. Um, it was a combination of two things. Um, I had an older half brother who was into the martial arts and he was about six, six and 200 and something pounds and used to throw me all around as all older brothers do. <laughs> um, and so that inspired me to want to I don't know. I don't necessarily want to say defend myself because he wasn't mean to me per se, but um, he also brought home a Bruce Lee movie and made me watch it. And I thought that was the coolest thing ever. And um, and then shortly after that, what was it, 1984-ish, The Karate Kid came out, I think. So it was just kind of a combination of all those forces um, combining. And my mom had uh, grown up with uh, a gentleman that taught martial arts in our neck of the woods and felt comfortable, I guess, bringing me there to take some classes. And uh, so started in Kempo when I was nine and, and uh, just never stopped. Oh, cool. Do you remember what Bruce Lee movie that was? Any chance? I want to say probably Chinese Connection, or, but that could just be because it's my favorite Bruce Lee movie. I don't know. <laughs> Well, we're telling stories, yeah. so by all means, let, let, it'll be Chinese connection. Right. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Why not? Nobody Stories don't always have to be 100% accurate right. to be worth telling. <laughs> have you stayed with Kempo throughout? I mean, are you, you know, have you been on the same path or have you no. been training? You know, we the 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 little Ma and Pa school system that I that I grew up through um, you know, I give a lot of credit to a gentleman named uh, Sean Flanagan, who became my instructor as a teenager. Our, our, the person running the school left and Sean took over. And Sean was really the, the person who's the most instrumental in kicking me out the door to meet other martial artists, um, you know, knowing how much I enjoyed kicking. Um, 
there was a seminar with uh, Grandmaster uh, Wallace going on in the next next state over, and we actually weren't even allowed to leave our school to go do outside seminars. I'm sure some of the listeners are familiar with the systems where the, the master doesn't want you to leave because he doesn't want your money going to somebody else or possibly seeing something cooler than what we're doing, you know, in-house. But mm. I give Sean credit because he knew that that basically with my ability to kick and my desire to kick that I should meet Superfoot. And um, so basically when I was 18 years old, I met Superfoot at a seminar and I had already had his DVDs and videos and tried to work his chambering and kicking. And I was at a seminar where not a lot of people could actually kick above the waist. It was more of a self-defense system. And so because I had my knee up, I think Bill saw it in the first 10 seconds of being at the seminar and uh, walked over to me and leaned on my leg and gave me a hard time about that uh, my legs better be able to to lift that high when we're done kicking because most of you that that know him from you know days of old there was just thousands of repetitions of of kicks and slow kicks and endurance drills and um so though i died we became very good friends <laughs> um and then through master wallace uh, i met a gentleman named soke michael de pasquale jr uh, back in the i'd say maybe 94 ish time frame and the Kempo school that I was at really, the, the curriculum kind of died at, I was a third degree black belt and, and really it was just rehashing moves. Um, the instructor of that system had branched out from Kempo into Kung Fu. And a lot of, after you get the black belt, there really wasn't a lot of material to be learned. And um, so I, I saw Soke Di Pasquale and I thought, oh my God, I need to learn how to do all these arm bars, chokes and throws. I thought it was probably the coolest thing I had ever seen. And he lived in New Jersey and me being in New Hampshire really wasn't that far considering I had flown to California to live with Bill. So driving to New Jersey seemed like an easy, <laughs> very easy thing yeah. to do. So I, I drove monthly to New Jersey to, to do seminars. He had a, a third Sunday workout every month where different instructors would come and teach all day. and. Um, started following him around seminars and man, I've met so many people, you know, through Master Wallace over the years. Um, I, I sort of came back around to Kempo through Hanchi Bruce Jucknick um, for my own development and understanding purposes of, of the concepts behind a lot of the old set techniques. But uh, I don't know, I just love love kicking people. I love being able to be a part of Superfoot Systems in the capacity that I am. And though I, I have a lot of instructors that I would um, train under and support a thousand percent, much of my time and energy outside of running my own school is is with Superfoot at the time. Okay. So, so I can imagine some people that are listening to this right now and they're they're bouncing up and down in their chairs or screaming or whatever it is over something that you kind of glossed over um went to california to live with bill <laughs> so can you go back a moment and sure. tell us what <laughs> yeah it was, it was uh it's pretty surreal for me uh as well you know uh bill was really the first uh celebrity that i ever got to meet in the martial arts and i think just the the common bond of kicking sort of brought us together and you know, I said, Mr. Wallace, I'd really like to come train with you. Is there a way I could do that? And he said, sure, here's my phone number. Give me a call. We'll talk about it. And so I left thinking, you know, what answering service am I going to get when I call this number? You know, <laughs> you know what what gym secretary is going to answer? And, you know, so I waited a couple of days and then I was like, all right, I'll, I'll give it a call. And so it was actually um, Bill wasn't home the day that I called and I get his home answering machine and I almost dropped the phone. Like, how, you know, he gave me his home number. Is he crazy? Like, <laughs> he doesn't know me. He's, what's he doing passing out his home number? And uh, we reconnected, you know, when he, he, at the time he was traveling pretty much six days out of the week, if not more. So it's hard to catch him at home. But uh, when he did get home, he returned my call right away and we talked. I was in college at UNH at the time. And it was around uh, November. And um, so we set up basically the following summer when I was on break from, from college that I would come out to Los Angeles and train with him. And, 
you know, he, he would tell the story a little differently. Uh, he jokes that I called him every day to confirm that I was coming out next summer. I, <laughs> I just wanted him to remember who I was. So about once a month, I'd call and make sure, you know, are we really on? Are you sure you're training me next summer? This isn't some weird gimmick where you're telling me to come train and then you're not going to be there. And uh, closer to the, the date of me flying out there, uh, he was teaching out of Benny the Jet's place, which was the Jet Center in uh, Van Nuys at the time. And um, he said, you know, hey, the, the house that I'm renting out here, the guy's got an extra room. If you'd like to take that for $300 a month. I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> I said, that's, that's cheaper than any place I could possibly go. I think I'm just going to move. <laughs> yeah. But um, I spent the summer out there with him. And uh, he was just such a phenomenal guy, you know, probably learned more when we weren't training. Um just because I got to hang out with him and he wanted to make sure that I had a good time in my trip to California. So, you know, we'd, we'd head out every morning, grab breakfast somewhere and hit the driving range um, and just talk stories and martial arts. And at the time I had just turned 21 uh, when I went out to, to train with him. So uh, actually I might've been closer to 20 when I met him thinking about that story, <laughs> but uh, regardless, I had just turned 21 and, um, and it was a, I hadn't even left New Hampshire at that point, I don't think, other than a couple family vacations. So it was a pretty wild uh, time for me. And uh, he was just an amazing person. Well, that's cool. And, and the next question, of course, is, is your best martial arts story. But I want to twist that a little bit. <laughs> because one of, the, one of the things that I, I don't want to happen, I don't want our listeners to think of you as just this this secondary piece of Bill Wallace because you've got your own experience and and if I'm doing the math right you had over 10 years before he was an influence on you Correct. and you certainly have your own school now and you do your own thing but of course you do have this connection that none of the rest of us have that's pretty incredible so I want to ask you for two stories okay I want to hear your best story involving Bill that you're allowed to tell, because I'm sure there's some that you're not, uh, and then your best non-Bill story. Okay. Well, I had the Bill story actually pre-planned, uh, <laughs> so the non-Bill story we'll, we'll come back to. Um, sure. Yeah, I just told this story at Karate College. Um, they were doing a little pre-birthday celebration for Bill, and they asked me to speak, and uh, I will say that of all the teaching public speaking things I've ever done in my life, it was the most intimidating to be standing next to Bill telling a story about him. Um, mm. So it'll be way easier now that we're on Skype. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was competing in, and this actually just comes around um, to one of my favorite quotes by him. And that's why the story is funny to me. So I was competing in the Battle of Atlanta, probably in the, the mid to late 90s. And he was, he was watching. Um, rarely did he, he step in and actually be a, a coach on the floor because he had so many people that dealt with him that he didn't want to slight anybody by favoring someone on the mat. So he would sort of stand mm -hmm. off to the sidelines and then you'd get yelled at for everything when you got out of the ring. <laughs> and so I had gone into overtime with this gentleman. We were both kickers and we were both just going to town with the kicking and nobody was really scoring anything. And I think he hit me with one back fist and I hit him with one back fist, which brought us into overtime. And then I ended up uh, losing the match in overtime to a punch. And so, of course, I walk out of the ring and he's got the death stare. Like, what is wrong with you? You know, so I walked over. And so it, it's a two part story. So the first part, he says, let me ask you one question. I'm like, yes, sir. And he said, how many punches did you throw in your fight? And I said, one, sir. And he said, of those one punches, how many landed? I said, all of them. He said, what does that tell you? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I guess it tells me to throw more punches, sir. And he says, really? And so everybody that walked by for the next 10 minutes, Bill interviewed. If you're coaching a fighter and he throws a punch and he lands it, what would you tell that fighter to do? And, of course, they all say, punch again, and he'd glare at me. <laughs> <laughs> it turned into this whole ordeal and, and so we're walking back to the hotel later and when I lost in overtime I had tried to hit the guy with a hook kick and I think I either threw it 
I was trying too hard to win in front of him. I don't know, you know, what it was, but either way, I'd overturn basically so that my back was to the guy, and which allowed him to basically come through with his his punch. And so, you know, we're walking back, and he's like, "What are you doing? Turning your back when you kick?" And it, you know, it turned into another lecture. I was like, "I don't know, sir." And so he he has a couple leftover T-shirts in a bag, and he picks it up to hit me jokingly, like "You dummy." And I flinched when he picked the bag up. And he's like, oh, my God. He goes, look at me. He goes, it hurts the same whether you see it or not. Keep your eyes open. (laughs) 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 And so he proceeded to hit me with a bag of T-shirts until I could keep my eyes open, which was a a, and and I can only imagine we're standing on a street corner in in Atlanta. And there's this gentleman hitting me with a bag in the face. I don't know what people driving by were thinking, but I have to say it's one of my all time favorite quotes of Bill is it hurts the same whether you see it or not. Keep your eyes open. There there may have been uh, some profanity in the in the quote, (laughs) (laughs) but we'll leave it. We'll leave it PC. And there's a fair amount of valuable teaching in there, too. Funny or not. Right. Keeping your eyes open. Yeah, it was early. It's a little bit easier to adapt. And I can, <laughs> you told that well, and I can, I can totally see that. And of course, um, people that follow Whistlekick off, offline of the podcast know that, you know, we met through us putting on a seminar mm-hmm. with Superfoot. And I got, was fortunate enough to get to know him a little bit. And I can picture the facial expressions <laughs> that you're talking about. And I can Most completely Most of them, I see think, were anger. Uh, <laughs> I'm not surprised. Uh, you know, Bill, can, if, you're the, if you're just in a seminar or you're just, you know, learning from him, he's extremely encouraging. And, and not only does he have a phenomenal eye for what you need to do to fix something, but he'll find a way to make you feel good about something you do um, when you're you know, being that I lived with him and was competing and going into kickboxing, um, there's a completely different side of Bill that wants you to be the best. And I mean, I think he wants everybody to be their best, but when you're sort of representing him, um, he's a lot more harsh. Let's put it, (laughs) let's put it that way. There's a, there's a private side that you wouldn't see in normally. Do you think that comes from you know, high standard, high standards and perfectionism. Oh, absolutely. He seems pretty hard on himself. He's the most self-critical person I've ever met in my life. Um, not, you know, not trying to sound bad, but you know, he, I don't think has ever been happy with anything he's done. Um, which makes the rest of us think like, Oh my God, you know, if you're not happy with what you're doing, what the heck are we going to do? Yeah. Um, but he never looks at it that way. You know, to him, it could always be better. It could always be sneakier. It could always be faster. Um, there's some aspect of it that he wants to improve about himself and, you know, and that's just contagious. I mean, when you see somebody that's that good, that still wants to improve it, you can't help but want to train hard and, and be the best that you can be, you know, not only for yourself, but just to, you know, for me, it was not to let him down, you know? Right. Well, that's a great story. And I'm hoping that through that, you've had a chance to shift some of your brain into a non-Bill story. And, <laughs> and you got something for us there? Oh, geez, man. There's so many. Um, I guess I'll go back to, I had I had just gotten my black belt. And I think I got it at 15 and a half. So I was 16 because I just started driving and it was the summertime. And as a black belt in our organization, you could purchase a red karate uniform. And it was the coolest thing that, you know, ever for me, because coming up through the system we did, it was, you know, white uniform at white and orange belt and black uniform at purple belt and blue uniform at blue belt. And they, I just probably like sales marketing more than anything else, but we didn't know that as students, we just thought, oh, it's so cool. We get to wear this uniform. And so I had the red uniform on and it was the middle of July and I was driving my truck back from a testing that I had helped out with and there's an intersection near my house that is a it's a flashing yellow light in my direction and a flashing red light in the other direction and a extremely large motorcyclist uh, had pulled up to the stop sign portion of it and assumed I was stopping and I had shifted to look and see if people were coming from the other direction and I was I had slowed down to maybe 20 miles an hour because I felt like somebody was going to cut out in front of me and so this guy sure enough pulls right out in front of me I slam on the brakes I bump his 
motorcycle. And as a, you know, as a motorcyclist myself, and I'm sure many of the listeners, you know, are super protective of their bikes. And uh, mm. so here's this kid, you know, that bumps into this big Harley guy's custom bike. And uh, he, of course, drops it. Nobody's hurt, but he's just mad that I've hit his bike. And the guy had to be 300 and something pounds. And I, being 16, weighed about a buck 20. And six foot one, he, he could have pulled me through the window with one hand, you know. And so he comes over to the window and he swears at me about hitting his motorcycle and blah, blah, blah. And he gets to my window. And in my mind, his hand was reaching in the window. Now, whether it was or not, I don't know. But he's reaching in the window and he sees the red karate uniform with the black belt on. And he stops and he goes, you're a black belt? And it, I didn't even have words. I'm so scared, you know. I'm just looking at this guy and I nodded my head without opening my mouth. And he goes, oh, and he turns and walks back to pick up his bike. I was like, oh, my God, I got to tell my mom that just paid for every martial art lesson I've ever had. <laughs> like the red gi just saved my life. So the, the moral of the story is that we should all be wearing should, red gi. Yes, uh, because things with a lot of stripes, I think. It, it'll, it'll avoid <laughs> self-defense situations entirely. So I don't have any idea, but that one saved me, man. I don't know. I don't think any martial arts... Uh, was going to help me against the angry biker that was three times my size at that point. Yeah. You know, there's a reason for weight classes and fighting. I don't. I don't think I had a shot. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, well, that's those are two great stories, and I appreciate you sharing them, and, and especially the one that I didn't really tell you you were going to have to <laughs> share with us when we went over all this. But I want to switch gears a little bit now and, and dig into who you are as a person. And of course, the martial arts has been a huge part of your life. And you started, you said when you were nine? I was nine, yeah. So there's not a whole lot of, of Sensei Dao before martial arts. But if you could imagine what you would have been without it, you know, how, how would you say the martial arts has changed you? Man, it's changed everything. I mean, I was a shy, nervous, quiet teenager that. You know, even even though I was taking martial arts as a teenager, I was still really um, insecure and, and quiet and shy. Um, so let alone the fact that I was going to college for electrical engineering. So I'd have, I guess I'd have done something completely different than martial arts had I not met Bill. Um, but, you know, my instructor was more of a guidance counselor and, you know, just helped through pretty much every day to day thing that a teenager could go through from lack of confidence asking out a girl to afraid of the bullies that are picking on you at school and you know I mean I'd go in the office I'd, I'd leave I'd leave school go right to the karate school and uh, Sean would be there to go what's up buddy <laughs> I don't know and drag all the info out of me and by the time I got to college it just had made a complete you know physical and mental change where I had received my black belt and I thought, geez, if I can do that, I mean, why am I nervous about anything else, you know? And at the time I got into the sport karate circuit and was competing around New England and occasionally flying to, you know, other places to compete. And um, just knowing that I would, would end up competing at some point against the best black belts in the country in the circuit that we were on really made me look at every other real life situation completely differently. I thought, you know, man, I don't have to be bothered by this bully. Like he has no idea what he's getting into. You know, I feel bad for this guy. And it just gave me the confidence to walk away from everything. You know, I really don't have a lot of, a lot of stories where I had to fight. I was a pretty good talker and able to maneuver my way around a lot of things. But yeah, I mean, martial arts really gave it all to me, let alone, you know, how uncoordinated I was. So well, clearly that part changed. <laughs> I bit. can attest to that. I, don't know, I still trip over things, but <laughs> I'd probably be dead if it weren't for one spot. <laughs> so at least save me with the brake falls, right? Yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot of high points that we've gone over, a lot of a lot of fun points. Let's go the other end. How about a low point? Something something rough, something challenging that your martial arts training and experience helped you move through. I think everybody has those low points. I mean, I can't think of a time, you know, obviously 
broke it up with the girlfriend I was living with and living out of my office for a short period of time. <laughs> I guess the Mont Blocks gave me a place to live. Sure. Um, but, you know, always being able to channel negative energy and or aggression into, you know, going to the gym and hitting a punching bag and training and, and just focusing on being the best martial artist I could be, I think, saved me from any other outlet, you know, whether it would have been self-destructive or just, you know, feeling like I needed to go to the bar to fight somebody because I, I couldn't go train. I mean, I don't know who knows what those other outcomes would have been, but, you know, there's certainly times where, you know, you're not in a, not in a relationship anymore, basically no place to live, but Hey, I got martial arts. It's okay. Mm. Were you, were you an angry kid? No, I don't think kinda, so. No. Okay. Sounded like you were hinting it's, at that, well, you know, through the, through the, junior high and high school because I was quiet and shy I got picked on daily and I think that builds a certain amount of anger uh, yeah. so I don't have a lot of tolerance for bullies so to speak but uh you know it took me till uh later in my high school days my my physics teacher knew that I did martial arts and asked on my senior year a couple weeks before the end of my senior year um asked if if I would be willing to do a, uh, it was like a seventh period assembly thing they used to do and they'd have different topics. And she's like, would you want to demonstrate some martial arts? And I was like, I guess so. And um, so she set this thing up for me and, you know, about a hundred kids, the, our, our school had about 250 kids per class and four years. So it'd be a thousand kids at the high school. Um, and a couple hundred of them came, I think mostly from my senior class and of those people that came, some of them were the very bullies and people that were picking on me. And it was kind of ironic because I did all the self-defense demos and throwing people around and break the boards and the bricks and you do all that stuff. And some of them actually came up to me afterwards like, oh, man, I didn't know you could do that stuff. I shouldn't have been picking on you. Just kind of joking with me. I'm like, great. Two weeks before the end of school, I finally get you guys to lay off. I mean, <laughs> should have done this freshman year. Yeah, right. I should have done the demo way sooner. Um, and here I am thinking the demo is going to get me picked on more, you know, but it, it somehow worked the other way. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Man. I wouldn't say angry, but um, definitely a lot of pent up stuff from certain experiences, you know. Yeah, I, I can relate to that. You know, I, I sounds like our childhoods were pretty similar. <laughs> so I get it. So other than I mean, you, you've rattled off a few people that you've trained under. Who would you say, and, and we're going to take Bill out of this, <laughs> other than Bill Wallace, because he's the, he, I'm sure he would be the answer. Who's been the most influential martial arts instructor for you? Well, I'll go back to, to Sean Flanagan, um, because he's the one that pushed me out the door to meet Bill. And he was the one that, you know, I, I came back from that seminar saying, you know, Superfoot wants me to come to LA and train. He goes, oh, great. When are you going? what do you mean when am i going you know I don't, I don't know if i am going and he's like superfoot asked you to, to to come train in california the answer is you know when can i get there sir not i don't know if i'm going and yeah. so you know he was really always the one to, to push me out the door and um we both he and i both somehow met so okay michael de pasquale at the same time and so you know i took that first seminar it was um Bill Wallace, Joe Lewis, and Michael De Pasquale at a guy named Bob McEwen's um, Aikido school in New York. And um, I got to train. That was the first time I saw um, So okay Mike. And, and, you know, I came back and I called Sean immediately. I'm like, have you seen this guy? He goes, oh, my God, I just met him last week. I was like, you're kidding. And so the two of us sort of began a journey under him. And uh, Sean essentially, I, at least in my opinion, um, you know, kind of did what I did with Bill, where he spent, you know, a lot more time going to Jersey and training with with Michael. But he was always the one that I could come back to. And every time I thought I learned some cool new thing, I'd show it to him and he'd be like, I told you that years ago. And, oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I was I was too dense to, to understand your teaching then, sir. You know, and, uh, and we'd always compare notes. And he was, you know, like I said, just always an extremely positive, motivational force. Um, he's the one that talked me into opening a school while I was in college and he said, you know, I know you're not sure what you want to do, but we want to open a branch in Manchester, New Hampshire, and we'd like you to run it. 
And I said, oh, man, I don't know if I could run a school. And he's like, what do you mean? You know, he's like, we'll, we'll guide you through every step of the way. All you have to do is teach classes and listen to us. So, well, that can't be too hard to do if I just listen to you guys and teach. So I uh, ended up opening my school and um, just, you know, again, he was there to kind of guide the, the business aspect of it, continue the training because um, Superfoot living in L.A. at the time. I'm not going to be able to fly out there on a regular basis. So, right. um, you know, sidebar, I just kind of followed Bill whenever I could get to him after that. You know, we um, we went on went on little mini tours where I'd go for a week or two weeks at a time on his seminar circuit because essentially he was teaching every single day of the week somewhere. And he'd go regionally. Let's say he came out to, you know, New England. So he'd do a seminar Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and we'd be in Massachusetts, Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, Connecticut, Rhode Island. And so I'd just do a little mini tour with him. Um, but I'd always have, you know, Sean to kind of come back to keeping me grounded and, and helping me push with the, you know, the school stuff and everything uh, back at home, so to speak. Are you guys still in touch? Yeah, absolutely. I just saw him. Uh, uh, Actually, the Saturday of the seminar, we grabbed a bite to eat after um, we hosted Bill a couple weeks ago, right before you guys. So I talked to him at least weekly. So he's still influential in your life. Yeah, he's uh, one of the one of the best men in my wedding as well. So oh, cool. he and my old training partner, uh, Jeff Littlefield, I talked to. And uh, Jeff was, was great because um, he was... He was always gung ho about training hard, and neither of us cared about the bumps and bruises of, of you know, trying to train with some reality and intensity. And as you know, some training partners, you know, don't want you to hurt them or touch them, or they don't want to spar or they don't want contact. And so, not only was I fortunate to have the teachers that I've had, but to have my training partner, um, you know, Jeff and I were just crazy gung ho, beat the crap out of each other. That was awesome. Hug it out, go grab a bite to eat. You know. <laughs> Nice. So, so we, so we hinted a little, a little bit about your time, your time through competition, but can, but can you dig, in, dig into that a little bit more? Tell us about it. Yeah, um, you know, I got I had some really cool opportunities through uh, Superfoot again. I, I met a gentleman uh, gentleman named Don Rodriguez out of Rhode Island, who at the time was the the well, still is the Paul Mitchell, um, you know, team captain. And so we did a seminar down at his school and uh, he pulled me aside after the seminar. It was only about an hour and a half from me and said, anytime you want to come down here and train, um, you know, it, it's helpful for me to have a kicker like you so we can sort of train against it, so to speak. And at the same time, you'll get a lot of experience. And so I was doing a lot of sport karate stuff at the time. And then I started going down to his school every other week to sparring night, which had maybe 30 or 35 people. And then on tournament weekends, it would have any of the John Paul Mitchell guys that were in town. So I had just a fantastic opportunity to spar with all of the local team members who were just phenomenal. Um, and so I did, you know, the basically the, the mid 90s to 98, um, every karate tournament I could get my hands on. And, you know, the mixed reviews of, of results, so to speak. Um, anytime I was not fighting the nationally ranked guy, I would, I would pretty much win easily. And then if I was fighting the nationally ranked guy, it would be sort of a good battle, but, uh, sometimes politics would go the other way. And sometimes, you know, you just, those guys are, were just better at the time. And, uh, so then I thought, well, you know, if I kickbox and I knock somebody out, there's no more politics. And so I got into kickboxing. Again, uh, Don Rodriguez helped promote a couple events and, and get me some opponents. And I had um, I lost my first full contact match by a decision. I had thought that, well, I knew there was 10 seconds left in the final round, and I knew I was ahead. And I was exhausted, as anybody that's had a, a first full contact fight will know how exhausting it really is. Um, your adrenaline just dumps everything and, and you, you pretty much just on, you know, overdrive uh, for the, the second part of the fight, at least for me. And um, so he threw a front kick and I thought, I'm just going to bounce off the ropes and clinch. And then the fight's going to end and I'm going to win because I'm tired. 
Well, the ropes weren't right behind me as I thought they were. And so the front kick pushed me back and then I didn't bounce off anything. And as I put my foot back, it actually hit the ring apron and I slipped and fell, uh, thusly being called a knockdown. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and so I get up, we go back to the corner and coach says, you know, you had the fight won until about eight seconds ago. They're going to call that a knockdown. You're going to lose the round. And because it's a knockdown, you're going to lose the fight. And so I was so depressed for for weeks. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't want to do anything. I didn't want to train. I was just mad at myself. And so he calls me up and he said, you know, you had a phenomenal fight. Like you can't, you can't just be stuck in your own head and, and upset. You, you got to get back out there. And I was like, well, yeah, I know what you're saying, you know? <laughs> and so a couple more months went by and, and Bill calls me up. He says, Hey, I'm going to be down at uh, the ocean state. Um, you're going to come down. And I was like, yeah, of course, you know, we'll, we'll kick some people, have some fun. And so I went down the, um, about four days ahead or so to, to work out with the Paul Mitchell guys and, um, coach's son, Christopher says, Hey, you trying out for the Waco team? I was like, I don't know, man. <laughs> and he's like, what do you mean? And I said, I don't know if we're going to try out for the Waco team. And uh, I haven't really competed in a while and blah, blah, blah. And he just stopped and looked at me like I was nuts. And he's like, Terry, there's there's nobody in, in the country that you're going to have trouble kicking in the head. What are you even worried about? And I was like, I don't know. And so... I was like, I guess I'll try. So now we're going into, you know, three months of zero cardio and all this stuff. And, and so I'm like, well, I guess I'll try out for the team. And so, you know, Bill's standing off to the side and, and I'm fighting this guy. And I was trying to fit. He's really, really good uh, boxer. We were doing I, I was going for the continuous contact um, division of the team, which is similar to kickboxing. As a matter of fact, if anybody's done it, depending on your opponent, it's exactly like kickboxing. Um, <laughs> you know, the referees, some of them will just let you try to kill each other. And as long as nobody actually gets hurt, there's no warning for excessive contact. And other referees, you know, if you touch the person, oh, wait, wait, take it easy, just continuous. But I only found one or two of those referees when I competed in continuous. Um, a lot of times I didn't pull a single thing. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, neither did my opponents. And it was just, to me, it was kickboxing, you know, and it was a cool outlet because you could do it on a fairly weekly basis if you could find tournaments mm. that had continuous contact divisions. So uh, back to the story. So I get into the thing and I'm fighting some guy that that's come up from um, – uh, somewhere in Georgia or something like that. And and he's got these really good hands and we're getting on the inside and I'm kind of um, clinching and, and just working the inside game. And I think I stepped on his sparring boot or something. And so he had to take a quick like timeout to fix his gear. And I'm looking over and, and guess what? I'm getting the death stare. I'm super quick. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, get over here. And so I ran over. And I'm like, yes, sir. He's like, you and I are the only two people in this room that don't think you're getting the dish beat out of you. To use the swear. And so, <laughs> so I was like, what do you mean? He goes, I know you're blocking the stuff on the inside, but how do you think the referees are going to score this fight? He goes, get back out there and kick him. And I'm like, yes, sir. And so they said, go. And I nailed him with a sidekick and dropped him. And I thought, what the heck was I doing? You know, <laughs> I don't really know why I was fighting the inside game. It was just, you know, I'm in my head trying to figure out the strategy of the fight. And I knew this guy was good and I didn't want to make a mistake. And then it came down to as simple as, dude, just kick him, you know? And so I ended up beating him and getting on the Waco team. Um, and that was in uh, 99, early 90, March of, of 99 were the tryouts, I believe. And uh, the competition was set for Italy. And um, so just had an amazing experience of being with the U.S. Waco team, uh, fighting in Italy and competing. I lost to the Italian fighter in my weight class in Italy with Italian judges. So it went to a decision. Um, I was mad at myself again because I, I felt like rounds one and two, I was pacing myself a little too much. And round three, I, I believe I won. And uh, same feedback from coach. Like, yeah, you fought him rounds one and two like you fought him in round three. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, so um, – I did a lot of focusing on my school after that opportunity to be in the world championships. Uh, they were only every couple of years. Um, so I, I did a lot more focus on just building the school, building my students, having some of them compete. Um, and then a few years ago, my, my wife, uh, who had 
come to me years ago, actually as a, a student. I don't know if that's taboo to talk about on the show, but <laughs> no, we don't, no subject people, is off limits. You know, you know how you get the the uh, what is it, the protocol stuff, and I think I agree ninety nine point nine percent of the time, but. If it weren't for martial arts and, and my wife training with me, I would never have met her. And, well, and I think that's an important distinction. Your 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 wife and and now the the mother of your child. Right. I don't think that's quite the scenario those <laughs> protocols are set up to prevent. Yeah. Uh, well, either way, um, she was competing and uh, doing some kickboxing, and she won um, a. A title, a lightweight kickboxing title through an uh, organization called Girl Fight USA, which was run by Christina Rondo down in um, Rhode Island. And um, so we, I had her try out for the the kickboxing, um, you know, position on the U.S. team in 2011, and she made it. And so, you know, I'm talking to Coach Rodriguez, and at the time, um, I had secured a spot on the. Uh, the continuous contact team the same year uh, by default. Nobody showed up in my division. And so they were going to break it up and the, the continuous contact was going to go to Macedonia. And I thought, where the heck is that? And then the, the sport karate and the full contact teams were going to go to um, Ireland. And I was like, I don't want to go to Macedonia while you guys take my wife to Ireland. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so he said, well, there's a, you know, if you want to do, do sport karate again, he said, there's a, um, there's a guy in the, uh, the light heavyweight division, which was up about 10 pounds for me, uh, it was the 190 division. And I was about 183. And he said, you know, basically I'll, I'll arrange a fight for you guys. And the winner stays on the team. And if you're on that, you can come to Ireland with us because it's a different division. I thought, gee, that sounds fun. So he set up a fight for me in Connecticut, and I beat the guy and ended up on the sport karate side of the team and got to go to Ireland in 2011 and uh, lost to the Irish guy in Ireland. I don't know what the heck it is with me going to world <laughs> championships and fighting the home team. But uh, again, you got to stay here in the U.S. I, yeah, man. My, I mean, of the odds, the fifty-something countries that com that participate in the Waco World Championships, I've been twice and drawn the home country in the first round. I don't get it. So, but you know, it's all that joking aside. It was just a blast, and the the guy that I fought was great. We had an awesome fight, and I felt much better about my 2011 performance at uh, 39 years old than I did in uh, you know in 2000 uh, and nine um so or 1999 yeah. i'm sorry I lost a decade <laughs> it happens it's okay so uh christina ended up fighting um the european world champion uh who went on to the gold medal round so that was that was a great fight but unfortunately we did not progress ourselves but just an awesome team atmosphere and sure. um now i'm still just traveling with bill trying to basically show people how superfoot systems can work for them. So cool. Well we're gonna we're gonna come back to that a little bit. It's hard not the, to the plug. The plug. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I, I wanna I wanna yeah. give you some time to talk about what that what that's about. But you've trained with with some incredible people. I mean let's let's not discount that. But if you could train with anybody you haven't, whether they be alive or dead, who would it be? I'd say, you know, it's a, there's probably two answers for me only, you know, because when I was a kid, it was a Bruce Lee movie that inspired me and following Bruce's philosophies, um, essentially growing up after that for training, I would have to say him just because, you know, that was instrumental in me getting involved in martial arts in the first place. Um, you know, I met Dan and Asano and trained with him briefly, and I think that's probably the the next best thing in today's age. Uh, but you know, digressing from that, from that, I think it would have to have been Bruce. Um, outside of the fact that I, I did get to meet Chuck Norris, but not train with him, and he was such a phenomenal competitor, you know, in late '60s, early '70s, and just such a super, super nice guy. And he and Bill are really good friends, so. Um, I don't know that he trains anybody anymore or I would have the opportunity to do anything, but that would be certainly a bucket list because he's, he's alive, you know? Right. Well, if you ever do get the opportunity to train with Chuck Norris, you have to come on the show and tell us All about right. it. We'll, we'll throw that in as a mini episode. <laughs> sounds, because, sounds good. Uh, 
Uh, I'll bring a hidden camera. Yeah, yeah, GoPro. Uh, we will sponsor. <laughs> he won't know. Thirty-seven cameras strapped to your body. We'll capture it from every angle and release it. Three D immersive. Be Chuck's so foot hitting me, and then you'll see ceiling. <laughs> wow, we wouldn't want to get knocked out by Chuck Norris. Yeah. I'd do it. It'd be incredible. So you mentioned Chinese Connection as your favorite Bruce Lee movie. Is that your favorite martial arts movie? It's one of them, I think, simply because, you know, I, I like the movies where the hero is the hero and he's, for lack of a better way to put it, you know, already a badass sort of defending himself for the rights of others. And, and that's just like the feel good movie for me. I don't like seeing the kid get picked on for half the movie because even though the end of the movie is great, it makes me mad for the first half. Um, yeah. And then, you know, segue to like a Jackie Chan because the movies are just so much fun. Um, you know, he's just such an amazingly skilled person. Uh, the choreography is phenomenal and they're just fun to watch all the way through, you know. So I don't know that I could pick a title per se, but um, if you have to pick a title, I guess you can go back to Chinese Connection. <laughs> How about your favorite martial arts actor? Is that Bruce Lee or is that somebody more modern? No, I mean, I don't know that, I don't know that Bruce falls into the actor category for me. You know, I mean, he was just kind of a martial artist showing his system via some fight scenes in, in movies, um, at least in the way I view it, you know? So um, probably, probably Chuck because he's done so many different, you know, different things, some of it being Marshall and some of it being comedy or action or drama. I mean, I think he's sort of my favorite overall. Okay. Are you a book guy at all? Any martial arts books? No, not really. I have, I, in my teenage years, uh, Sean made me read books and, and report back in on different philosophies <laughs> but uh, as part of my martial growth. But uh, quite honestly... I'd rather at this point zone out and watch a zombie movie or something uh, <laughs> than than take too much time to sit down. And I'm a slow reader, so it, it you know if I get on a plane, maybe I'll I'll read and I'll get a chapter done, and I go, oh hey, I'm in California. <laughs> like wow, that went well. So I don't get very far. That's okay. There's you know we get so many books recommended on the show. Often the guests have two, three, four books that my reading list for the next 10 years is probably full <laughs> See, because I, I, I'm, I'm not a huge reader myself. Movie. Absolutely. I appreciate it. You give me a little bit of a anything. reprieve yeah. for a week. <laughs> Read uh, so Ultimate you, Kick by Bill Superbo. Yeah, I, was, I, I wasn't even going to say it, <laughs> but that was my expectation <laughs> when you said, I'm not much of a reader, but I was expecting it. <laughs> yeah. But give me a picture book. You, oh, look, Bill <laughs> kicking someone in the head. Perfect. <laughs> you can flip through it and see the fight scene and then you're done. <laughs> we, sh we should, uh, we should make a flip book. <laughs> see if see if he'll make a flip book, which is no words. Just brrr, we could just you know. do that. We just take a bunch of his pictures and stick them together. Um, a great idea. Funny, funny aside. Um, I've had to get throw out at least three quarters of the pictures I've taken of him <laughs> because his foot is too blurry. <laughs> He's still so darn fast that with, know. you know, with my good camera, with my good lens on the right settings, I just, I, I can't, I can't <laughs> capture it. So definitely no way to block it. Um, nope, not, I mean, you, you think if you're a third person watching it, you think, yeah, maybe I'll tell you what, man, when it's coming at you uh, to this day, it, it'll, he'll be 70 later this year. And I don't have a clue where it's going. And, yeah. you know, he jokes that neither does he, but honestly, he has the best reaction to your reactions of anybody I've ever met. I mean, he literally senses what you're doing as you're doing it and changes the technique. I mean, he's, he's set his system up in a way that allows him to see what you're doing and then change midstream. I mean, you know, the, the sneakiness and the step ups and the chamber positions, um, give him the the time to see what you're doing and then he just throws one of the other techniques that comes from the same position so i don't know that that'll ever change if he can raise his leg i think we're all doomed <laughs> still yeah yeah and it makes it makes you wonder you know what because you know you can you can watch video and everything but of course video back from the 60s and 70s wasn't as good you know it's a little bit harder 
to get a sense of speed. Frame rates right. were different and everything. But just to have experienced him in, I don't want to say his prime, because that implies that he's <laughs> in prime, you know, nowhere near it. Yeah. And I mean, he, he'd still take me to task. But just to get a chance to work with him then, to see how much faster even then he was. Right. I mean, you can look at, you know, the video footage from um, 70s and 80s that's up on YouTube. You can, you can go back to Chuck's movie with him, The Force of One. And just <laughs> kicking off the charts fast in, in that. I mean, there's a hook kick he throws to somebody at a bar in that movie that just, I thought, oh, my God, you know, I thought I was getting the hang of this stuff. And then I watched that and I was like, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's only one bill. That's right. That's, you know, and that, that's a great movie to watch for that reason. Um, I don't know if there's a lot of other great reasons <laughs> to watch that movie. <laughs> as um, as one of our mutual friends who is also very close with Bill Wallace told me, um, he said, Bill, why'd you make such a terrible movie? <laughs> and, and, and Bill's response was, because they paid me. <laughs> <laughs> the great answer. <laughs> so I don't know if that really happened, but it does seem to sum up <laughs> That movie, and of course, if folks, if you haven't seen that movie, The Force of One, I'll, I'll, I'll link to it with all the other stuff that goes into the show notes. You've got to see it; it's on Netflix. So, let's take it back. We got two more questions, and then I'm going to let you run loose and, and tell us about Superfoot Systems and, and all this other great stuff that you and, and Bill are involved in. So, you're obviously still training, you're still teaching, you're still bettering yourself. What keeps you going? You got goals that you're trying to reach. What's you know, what's next for you? Yeah. Um, I mean, twofold, really. Uh, obviously, with my wife and, and now daughter here at the training station in, in Manchester, um, we obviously want to continue to inspire people and train them and motivate people. And, you know, for us, it's all about lead by example and, and make sure that we can do everything that we ask our clients to do. And, and I've always found that, you know, looking at someone like a Superfoot where, you know, he just sets the bar so high that it's always inspiring because you, you just keep trying to do that, you know. And um, a few years back, uh, Bill basically asking me to, um, you know, take on a, a senior student position, so to speak, the best way I can think to put it, um, you know, really makes you, for me, um, I want to be the best that I can be so that I don't let him down so that, you know, I can pass on the system the way that it deserves to be taught. And so for that, it really involves a lot of kicking and, you know, not as much stretching anymore. My, my, I had a hip injury when I was a teenager that hurts to get into a full split, but you don't need to be in a full split to kick somebody in the head. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I've, my body's pretty used to, uh, to being about 90% there and, uh, and just doing all the, all the moves and stuff. So, you know, still do a lot of training and teaching. I have a couple competitors. I, I had some MMA fighters that I was teaching for a while and you got to show those guys how the kicks work. And so you got to stay on your game and make sure that you can demo on everybody. You know, if you watch Superfoot in the seminars, he'll demo on every single person that, he can, and if somebody's even able to block a kick, then you're his partner, and he'll mess with you until he nails you. And to him, that's training, you know. So there's there's always a way to have fun. Uh, there's always something to improve. We're human, which means we can't be perfect, so we can always strive to be better. Um, so yeah, my goals are are just to be the best martial artist I could be, um, to represent my teachers, and um, and to be able to. You know, have a, a business with my family and and inspire and help as many people as I can. Um, martial arts did so much for me that I think I feel like there's a martial art for everybody. And it may not be one of the ones I'm teaching per se, but um, I encourage everybody to look at different options because they have different demands for training and some being physical, some being more spiritual, et cetera. Um, but I really believe that there's a martial art for everybody out there. And so it's, um, it just did so much for me. I want to do my part to give back. That's great. 
And I appreciate you sharing all that. So now it's your turn. I mean, obviously we know a lot about you. We know about your association with Bill Wallace. And if people didn't prior to this episode, they do now. <laughs> Forcing and it on them. Sem- yeah, yeah. We're cramming it down their throat. They're going to have to listen. <laughs> Don't tell them there's a mute. No, absolutely not. And there's no <laughs> skip or fast forward button on anything that you would play this podcast. <laughs> now, the seminars are still a big part of his life and now your life. So tell us what goes on at a Superfoot seminar and, and you know what are the relevant bits people might want to know and, and maybe if they wanted to schedule one at, at their school. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, at, at this point in – you know, Superfoot's career, he's trying to pass on the years of experience of um, basically teaching his material. I mean, he's, he's honed it down to such a uh, precise science of how to, how to move and how everything fits together and how certain things are sneaky and how this sets up this and how you fake certain techniques. I mean, there's a, uh, a physiological and psychological reason behind every single thing that he does. There's no, there's nothing that he hasn't thought out a thousand percent in this, in the system, the way that he teaches it in a seminar. So you'll get flexibility from him. You'll get the, the sneaky techniques and the sparring techniques and the kicking techniques, whether it's applied to full contact or sport karate, or just, you know, bettering your kicks in general. Um, there are days when he'll go through some of the old conditioning routines that he did um, which is really what allowed him to do so much kicking. Um, recreationally, not a lot of people want to go through that same routine. So we don't always force it on people when we're teaching if they um, are interested and, and catch us after about, you know, hey, how do I develop endurance or how do I get my kicks better? And then some drills may come up for how to do that. Uh, but it's, you know, it's pretty grueling work if you want to master it to the degree that, that Superfoot has. Um, and there's no shortcut. And I think a lot of people hope that there is. Um, and there's, a, there's, there's shortcuts to being able to do certain things and having fun and, and understanding concepts and improving yourself, but there is no shortcut to being as good as Superfoot. Um, and if you look at the history, nobody has ever been as good as him, in my opinion, for kicking. And you look at his, his training routine back when he was competing and it was just nuts. I mean, it was hours and hours and hours of cardiovascular sparring, kicking, you know, he'd do six, three minute rounds of just kicking. And every time he picked his foot up, at least two kicks or more would, would happen, you know, take the average martial artist to say, okay, I'm going to time you for six, three minute rounds. And all you're going to do is double kick and higher and they'll get one round, two rounds into it and be dying. And no offense to any of the listeners, but. <laughs> and most of us would use both legs. Yeah. And he's not. Right. And so the endurance aspect of that, you know, so. Um, so, you, you know, the the bread and butter of the seminars is, is basically the science that uh, Master Wallace has honed over the years. And there's certainly a substantial amount of information uh, and I encourage anybody that gets a chance to work with him to not only try to understand what minute science he's trying to teach, but also in just asking him questions, you know, how to how to improve something. How, let him just look at your chamber or your knee position or your step up and then attempt to put the ego aside and listen to the answer and go work on that answer. Because that's the other thing is we all... We all either think we're doing it or think that we understand and are doing it right. But in reality, we've probably got some, uh, what's the word for it? Yeah, I don't know, pre, predetermined thing in our head that, that keeps us from fully comprehending the complete lesson. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know how better to put it. We, uh, you know, yeah, There's, there's going to be some minute detail that could be improved. And if, if, you, can, uh, if you can, you know, humbly approach fixing that then a lot of progress will be made and if you if you think you got it then never mind (laughs) and i think that's great advice for anybody learning anything from anyone else you know to to keep an open mind to stay humble and be willing to receive that information but as you said and i just want to piggyback on this or really just validate it because i've seen it 
how good he is at drilling into what's holding somebody back. Say, try this, make this adjustment, which is not something you typically get right. at a seminar, at least in my experience. You know, people are usually looking at, at bird's eye view concepts. Right. And he will go as deep into you as you need to get better. Well, you get what you get from Bill. And what I mean by that is there are some teachers that are only going to show you a, a, a tiny piece of, of what they want you to learn. And you sort of have to earn your way into what I would consider a, a closed circle or inner circle of, you know, of the system to learn why things work or, or the way they are. Um, and with Bill, you, you get everything. I mean, you honestly get every answer to, to the best of his ability to help you, um, let alone the fact that, you know, some teachers are better at explaining than doing, or some teachers are way better at doing than explaining anything that they've done. Um, and you get someone like Bill, who's, you know, was a phys ed teacher, has a master's degree in physiology and kinesiology. Um, so he was already a teacher before, you know, really getting involved in a seminar teaching circuit or being a, a martial arts instructor. So the teacher came first and all this, uh, all the science and anatomy came first. And now it's just um, a huge part of, of what he conveys to people you now. Right. Sure. And of course, you know, if somebody wants to book a seminar, there's a contact form at superfoot.com. There is. And yeah. we'll, we'll link to that page from the show notes, which are whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. I'm sure listeners know that by now. Um, so cool. Any any last words? Any parting advice? I would, you know, honestly, just say that when I met when I met Bill, I don't know that I believed that um, I would be able to train with someone like him. And he was just such a phenomenal guy that that once I had the guts to go and ask him to do it and found that it really wasn't that hard to do. <laughs> my, my advice to people really is, you know, if there's anything that you want to do, don't, you know, don't have any hangups about it. Just, just go do it. And, you know, I was lucky that, that Bill is such a nice guy. And so my first shot at doing the training that I wanted to do worked out really well. But I think that, you know, like every industry, there's, uh, really nice people and then not so nice people. And I think, you know, don't let the experiences of the not so nice people keep you from trying to find somebody else that's going to take you under their wing like Bill did for me. Um, you know, I guess I, I could try to end with a, a Bill Wallace quote. Um, and he had, I won't tell the long story that goes with it, but the, the punchline basically is there are two types of people in this world. There are people that say I did it and there are people that say I could have done it. He said, don't ever be one of the people that says I could have done something. And because of the scenario that caused that advice, it's, it stuck with me, you know, very true to my heart. And I think that, uh, you know, it's really important for people to just try to do something, try the best you can. Don't, don't look back on life and wish that you had taken more time to do something with your family or taking more time to learn an art or, you know, whatever it is, just, just be able to look back at life and say, man, I, I did the things I, I wanted to do and feel good about it. Thanks for listening to episode 23 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. And thank you to Sensei Dao. If you like the show, please subscribe so you never miss out in the future. And if you could help us by leaving a five-star review wherever you download your podcasts, it would make a difference. Those reviews help new listeners find the show and you might hear us read yours on the air. If we do, Go ahead and email us at info at whistlekick.com and you'll get a free prize pack, including a shirt, water bottle, stickers, and more. You can check out the show notes with photos and links to everything we talked about today at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. While you're there, if you want to be a guest on the show or you know someone that would be a great interview, please fill out the guest form. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter so you can keep up on everything Whistlekick. If you want to follow us on social media, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, all with the username Whistlekick. While you're at it, check out the great stuff we have at whistlekick.com. Gear, shirts, pants, and a whole bunch more. All made for martial artists by martial artists. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.